Kumase. Aritz most basic Sony Boy is a coming of age story. The journey of the boy Nagara as he assimilates the nature of his coy childhood and grows the confidence and competence to confront the nuances of life. Of course, the catch with this anime is all the sci-fi dreadfulness, allegories and theological and existential crises that compose its narrative. Spoilers ahead. Sonny Boy narrates an escape from anxieties into a fantasy land and an eventual return to a new home, with its two surviving characters now prepared to overcome the adversities of reality. The lessons learned in those two years on a voyage across dimensions render the substance of Sonny Boy. But as a story, Sonny Boy leaves most of its subjects unexplained. Sometimes Sony Boy likes to infer meaning, but other times its symbols are thrown against the ocean of the blood, left loose for the viewer to discover and connect its implications. Although certain aspects of this series become concrete through their frequency, consistency and use of foreshadowing, there are far more vague moments up to individual interpretation. Naturally, this video contains both my deductions and interpretations of the story. In addition, I included numerous references to several philosophers. It's important to clarify that I'm not stating that the director, Shingo Natsume, planned any explicit reference to these philosophers. Instead, they are a crutch to expose oncoming complex ideas already digested by those thinkers. And considering the tsunami of different subjects and the steer of Sony Boy's narrative, to navigate it all is going to take us like over two hours. Jesus Christ. Let's waste no more time. In this world, time is subjective. It builds at a different pace for each person, each action, or each place. Weeks turns to years, as days come and go without notice, for the flow of time itself is convoluted. It starts with a group of students. Their fragmentation around different dogmas and conditions is instantaneous. During the second conversation of the series, Hoshi starts to refer to his classmates as sheep, a recurring symbol of devotion and obedience to God in Abrahamic religions. And of course, Hoshi considers himself their shepherd, an obvious allegory of a prophet or savior. With ambitions that encourage dominance, Hoshi initiates a social contract of rules and rulers, duties and punishments, and corruption and abuse. And for those in doubt, the shape of death, his powers may summon. Hoshi doesn't care about anyone's point of view or well-being. He will happily keep his classmates blinded by ignorance and despair as long as they do what he says. Once they reach Hateno Island, despite their lack of need for more resources, the students start to organize around their social growth. The conditions for an economy materialize and with it, tension arises. A cycle of labor and consumerism becomes the only role assigned for many adrift students. In contrast, other students can relax, have fun, or like Mizuho, live like royalty, separated from the stress and concerns of her classmates. But as inequality increases, so does the tension between students. A flashback to the real world depicts a similar conflict. A rigged student council election not only goes unpunished, but instead fires back at the person who believed in doing the right thing. The rules are different for the elite, and the problems they create are beyond individual effort. 
lesson in life for the girl who can help almost anything. But preaching the words of God as a social unifier also demonstrates its inefficiency. Cautious efforts to keep everyone united under one dogma and the fear of damnation fall short against the influence of money. Meanwhile, as the students they cycle becomes monotonous, the gap widens. Long hours of hard work under the sun's heat await the commoners without powers. Their well-being is not a priority. But for the ones with power, workloads are easy and carried out from comfortable positions. A benefit present even for those without much talent. This situation highlights how their division doesn't reflect the efforts or achievements of some students above others. This is not a meritocracy. If we draw a parallel to real life, the students with superpowers are like the kids raised in wealthy families, while the students without superpowers are part of the proletariat. Indeed, their situation is not too different from a real world. But there is a catch. In a real world, the social status of those with power is difficult to achieve. But for those rejected or unable to meet the social demands, a window of opportunity closes. Hikikomori is a social phenomenon in modern Japan where a person, usually young, isolates themselves from society, avoiding the pressures of school and work. Wrapped in curtains, Hateno Island hides a similar comfort zone. As a result, the only trace of these people's existence is from the stain they cast on the rest of their community, the shell they leave for everyone else to see. But even for the misfits, the unpopular, their powers remain an advantage. From the beginning, Mizuho sits alone, like a rejected. But the others also envy her. She is not a proficient worker, reluctantly doing the few tasks assigned to her. And yet, her social status is above everyone else, despite choosing a life not so different from that of the students hidden behind curtains. Mizuko fits their mold, but her powers also keep her above them. All students might live in the same world, but their conditions create different realities. Luckily, the reclusive students and Mizuho get help from the kid who can change worlds. A realization that Nagara slowly starts to learn. With his powers, he can prevail against the world, alter opinions, and change reality, even if it's just for a second. But how she believes he is the savior. Seeking to spread his enlightenment of nepotistic basis, he volunteers to go adrift by attending a school on the day of the rapture. In the name of God, but without his request, Hoshi takes the mission of becoming a savior by protecting his classmates from going astray. It's all about his vanity. But Hoshi believes he is the messenger of God. For that, he spread his credo to this community of students until he finds himself face to face with a person sent by God. And two sides of one gospel clash. God commands Hoshi to create a shelter capable of withstanding a calamity orchestrated also by God. 
But Koshi believes he is the root of hope by demonstrating time and time again his understanding of the drifting he manages to gain a group of loyal allies. However, his fatalistic and pessimistic demeanor starts to alienate the rest of his classmates. But Hoshi believes he is the star that illuminates the unknown. And for that, he must prove what for him has always been evident. And he is correct, but as he observes Rajdani's experiment fail, he also observes the world change and the authentic possibility of going back home. God has lied, a point of inflection in Hoshi's life. Henceforth, he stops hearing the voice of God. Nagara has proven him wrong. As Hoshi's pilgrimage ends, Nagara's journey is halfway through. During his trip to Babel, Nagara observes a light in the sky called Heaven. An unfinished tower aims toward, but its progress moves backward with no apparent end. And at the top of the tower, the elite, the Bidnik as they call them, are the managers of this construction. Comfort is the routine. And at the bottom, the idea of hope, a goal for the devotees to crave, but not to obtain. In this tower, there is no progress. If we look at their conditions through the lenses of historical materialism, a civilization advances by how its means of production shape the conflict of classes. But these workers have no ambitions. They get distracted building a tower for thousands of years without thinking about it. In their complacency, they get stuck in an era without progress or history. Staying in line with historical materialism, the role of religion will be born as a fundamental part of the social superstructure, the ruling class, towards the economic substructure, the working class, to preserve the status quo. Meanwhile, for Nagara, this tower represents something different. Carrying blocks in Babel is Nagara's first job after his graduation ceremony, symbolic of his entrance into working life. However, for this other aunt, Hope and faith are symbols that enrich life. A spark of joy and fulfillment in the harsh nonsense of existence. But for Nagara, a little spider does the trick. An intense appetite makes Nagara believe the spider is delicious, bringing a little bit of pleasure to his life, but just for a moment. Nagara quickly realizes it is just a trick of the mind that allows him to relish in his self-induced delusion. Their doctrine is a web of decay and submission that constrains life's aspirations. It makes them docile to the abuses from the lead above, like a predator that lures his victims by casting a light amid the darkness. But they like it that way. And the world is upside down. This group of students organize themselves into a social structure that encourages abuse from the ones above. For perpetual hard work feeds their hopes. A similar idea is explored in Max Weber's book The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. According to Weber, Protestant Christians, specifically Calvinists, 
cultivated a capitalistic spirit through the idea that hard work leads to salvation. As Calvinists saw their dedication to their job as an expression of their affection for God. In a way, Bieber said, Marx's historical materialism upside down by looking at religion as a foundation and incentive toward capitalism instead of capitalism stimulating religion. And with a similar realization, Nagara's powers become relevant. Facing the Leviathan, that is this structure, Nagara takes one of the most important steps in his development. He moves against the flow of his co-workers, turns the world upside down and descends in the direction above the light. Heaven is artificial. Finally, Nagara is back on the island, a place where a similar need for faith and acceptance allowed a few to exploit the students' vulnerabilities. In parallel to some real-life religions, the students at this point segregate into different communities. The branch of Hoshi, the followers of Aki, and the duet of Nagara and Mizuho, whose friendship grows stronger with each episode. Three groups and three different views of one god, despite all of them hearing the same voice. But then we have our best boy Rajdani embarking on a solo adventure to seek the truth. The only character whose fate, we are told, is not in God. Probably a reference to his Buddhism, a non-theistic religion that prioritizes a healthy mind over any belief in a supreme creator. So with a gift in hand and a farewell hug, but no direction to go, one last person must remember his fate, or rather, how he lost it. It all starts with an allegory, a baptism. A series of religious symbols keep echoing in the story, a book like a Bible and a building like a cathedral. With just a prayer, Kodama gathers the multitudes, feeds them. She turns water into soup, gives light to the night and life to the dying. Where Hoshi fails, she succeeds, a unifying entity for her community, a brand new Eden. And then it collapses. War makes manifest, it bursts in crimson tumors. And in this culture, war leaves the mist of despair. And in this culture, God is dead. All lights but one gone. And for the last man, there's nothing left but a feeling of regret. <laughs> Through blind loyalty, Yamabiko finds no solution to his problems, only a distraction from the issues that play his mind. The depiction of lavish fate as self-detrimental doesn't stop here. From the dock and war, we move toward the cats and the fanatics. In a light-hearted tone, the cats contrast the working students from episode 7. They desire to end their labor exploitation and receive support from an animal rights group. But when they encounter a this world divided by a single hair, animal sacrifices are, for some people, the next logical step. Two identical people with a suit and tie, one tries to reflect a state of maturity, but in his arrogance allows himself to chase a perpetual cycle of pointless animosity, contemplating on his actions only when it is too late. Meanwhile, his twin, in prayers and despair, is on a quest to reach God. 
His totem in the shape of an eagle symbolizes a spiritual messenger in some Native American tribes. Similarly, his shrine for animal sacrifices seems like a reference to the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, a place where animal sacrifices used to be common in the name of their God. All these suggest a desperate attempt to communicate with God, but instead all he finds is his nefarious messiah and a unique weapon. And after the first shot, one twin gazes at the sky, and after the second, the other does too, seeking for a sign of God. In the drifting, God is a voice that commands or proposes, but a voice enacting or imposing, choosing instead to enable his will through the manipulation of others. And so it is, throughout the entire series. Additionally, the statue of Romulus and Remus in episode 10 may be allegorical of the relationship between the twins and God. Let's avoid the details about the legend when this video is already long enough and just quickly enlist the similarities between these two stories. In the legend, Romulus and Remus are twin brothers looking for an augury, a divine message sent through birds. While in Sonny Boy, as mentioned, one of the twins looks for a sign of God. In the legend, birds guide the twins to the hill where they found the drum. While in Sonny Boy, birds represent a connection and eventual guide to their real world. In the legend, Emulius, usurper of the throne, sends his servant to kill the twins, although he fails. While in Sonny Boy, it is implied that God sent Aki to manipulate the twins into killing each other. Unlike in the anime, Romulus ends up killing his twin brother, Remus. The final link to the legend is the father of the twins, Mars, the god of war, a figure Emulius feared. Of course, war in Sonny Boy represents all those in direct opposition to God. The identity of the inventor of death is a mystery. But let's be clear, everything indicates that the person in question is Hoshi. There is plenty of evidence. In particular, his eyes and hairstyle match that of the person shown in Rajdani's story. It all goes back to episode 6 and God's deception shattering Hoshi's understanding of the world. Soon after, a confession. Betrayal and abandonment. Is there a better combination to sow a crisis of fate? There is also foreshadowing. Despite Hoshi only utilizing his powers a few times throughout the entire series, every time he unveils them is to paint on foreign minds an image of death and misery, all for his conviction to be a savior. But Hoshi is not a savior. He is the inventor of death and an adopter of war. We have a demonstration of Hoshi's tendencies from his counterpart in the real world. In episode 6, outside the school entrance, Hoshi sees adopt in a delicate state. Adopt, as I mentioned, is both a recurring symbol of the story and the biblical representation of the Holy Spirit. But it is implied that Hoshi kills the dope. That fact alone seems to solidify that he is not a divine savior. For the contrary, murdering a symbol of God is the perfect analogy for war in this series. Ah, but the final clue 
will be in Saihoshi's group. According to Rajdani, the members of this community saw themselves as the children of God and strived to keep their minds and bodies spotless by living without eating even a plant. The description of their communal behavior is almost like that of a cult. But unlike its dreadful real-life homonym, their behavior makes sense in a world where hunger cannot kill anybody. What is suspicious is their goal to be spotless. That language sounds like a cult, an indoctrination that removes liberties. However, Rajdani disagrees with that interpretation. Yeah, Promoting itself as an incredible and welcoming place is the bread and butter of cult propaganda. But nothing in the story suggests that Rajdani's perception of them is wrong. Nevertheless, their tragic end at their hands of their leader is, sadly, a common end for multiple cults. As Hoshi's horrible actions follow his hatred for God, it becomes necessary to look at the relationship closer. After all, some hints in the story suggest they could be family. Not only are there some physical similarities between the two, but the only family member that Hoshi mentions in the entire series is his grandfather, who in episode 2 demonstrates authority over the school, just like a principal. This will help explain how Hoshi sustained a relationship with God long before the drifting. Furthermore, their personalities are alike, with their affinity to manipulate the people around them. And with all the religious symbolisms in the series, it's even possible that they might be two versions of the same person. In other words, we have the grandfather the Grand Son and the Holy Spirit as a motif of the series. Hoshi at multiple points even talks with the voice of God. The esoteric conditions of these worlds originate in the real world. Or more specifically, in their real world. Before the drifting, before the birth so many worlds, supernatural powers already exist among the students. The paranormal spreads in the shape of urban legends hinting at an ongoing scheme happening within the school. Inside a bathroom or behind a curtain, Nagara encounters a portal. He doesn't know the method to find them, but he finds another again and again to the envy of some. A series of doorways to worlds that impose the ruling as the new ordinary. For Nagara, who possesses the power to move between these worlds, this action at first obeys his anxieties. As he relocates from one world to another, sometimes without noticing it. But these worlds define themselves in unusual conventions. It almost seems to be random, 
until I discover it breaks this perception. I jump back and forth between twin islands, one closer to the light and the other reveals that these worlds are not discoveries but creations from a single student, the portals being nothing more than the remnants of such power. The characters calling these worlds to the drift and its plethora of dimensions is a confirmed reference to Flatland, a book that explores the ethos of a society made of 2D geometrical figures living in a flatland and using their peculiar living conditions for social commentary. Initially, the book dedicates multiple chapters to a detailed explanation of the laws and unusual logic that applies to this 2D reality in a segment simply titled This World. Mizuho is the fierce character to demonstrate how some students could use their powers back in their real world. With just one order and the help of her three cats, Mizuho can possess almost anything she wants. But upon closer examination, it's all just a copy. Everything Mizuho orders and everyone who lives adrift is just a copy, even the cats. But slight variations create different results. Two clones of the same person demonstrate this, but I think a better example is their teacher Aki and her clone adrift. For the little we know and how little she appears, the Aki in the real world is actually a kind and sweet person, opposite to her adrift version who imposes her authority through anger and disdain, a contrast between the two that the students are quick to notice. The revelation that Aki and the thousands of other people imprisoned adrift originate as cloned students adds to the mystery of how the rapture happened. Guilt follows Mizuho, yet episode 10 confirms that the power to select, copy and transport anything or anyone in Amazon never belonged to her but to the three cats, and so Mizuho's true power remains hidden from everyone else, for its uniqueness carries the engine of their new lives. <coughs> Stasis Mizuho requests something, the cats provide it, and Mizuho captures its form. Their physical shape in a constant recovery towards a perpetual and immutable state. It can be an object, like a school that auto repairs itself, or a person, now an immortal being for the rest of time. There are a couple of methods to stop this stasis. The most common way is to conquer the individual. The word conquer in this context suggests a specific definition. Conquering is an act or event that distills a person into a single object by altering their mind or consciousness, often through external intervention and producing a power holdover as a result. Adrift, this is the only method of change. It is the closest state to death without violating the law of immortality. The transmutation into a power holdover is in an inherent tragedy, nor does it require external intervention. But those cases are few and far between. Conquering stands as the leading cause of extinction that we can witness in the series. Power holdovers are not only born from these students, some materialize 
from these words themselves. Like the blood curtain or the mouse with the shape of a mouse. And as the name suggests, power holdovers contained the rendered abilities of their former self. Like the gem inside a tree that bends the walls of this world with the same divinity she possessed in life. But the existence of this gem also signifies the conqueror of a demigoddess, revealing the greatest hazards of these worlds, the shape of war and God's death. Naturally, to conquer someone with the powers of a demigod requires an alternative approach. As Asakase demonstrates, immense power can affect the rules of the drifting. But when it comes to Kodamas, divine status, a disease for the mind, and Yamabiko as a tool is a requirement. Yamabiko is a person delimited by the servitude and passivity of his past self. His dog form reflects this. It is a variant of the conventional power holdover and the result of following Kodama like, well, a dog. He says that while acting like a dog, his true nature is like a dog. Some may think that Kodama is responsible for Yamabiko's metamorphosis. After all, her M power can control everything material. A physical alteration should present no complications for Kodama. But that doesn't seem to be Yamabiko's case. Instead, his dog form likely emerged from his inner self, just like the plague. A subconscious manifestation of his abilities. An epiphenomenon of Yamabiko's mental status creates a this world that manifests like a series of tumors. Yamabiko conceals them, but war imports this world and spreads it around. In such a resonance with his own power, the dog form serves Yamabiko as more than an expression of his identity. It becomes the shell that hides his insecurities from the world and himself. But war disrupts this idiocy. The plague reveals itself as nothing more than the result of Yamabiko's detrimental personality being a harmful presence to the people around him. Kodama cannot heal those wounds. The plague is not born in the material world, but in the mental world. Kodama, with the power of M, could shape space-time at her will. But the mind and the subconscious are in a realm beyond her reach, beyond her powers, and even beyond her introspection. And in those conditions, all Kodama can give to the mentally ill is a bit of hope. Yamabiko may be immune, but his substance is endemic. From his shell, he stays distant, observes the calamity of a civilization, and remains as the last man amongst the ruins choosing to sleep over a deceptively simple solution.
War shows otherwise. As the only creature who has recovered from the disease, this immoral being represents the antithesis to Yamabiko. He doesn't wait around for his deterministic with his life and holds pride in his actions, the necessary components to overcome this plague. Worse than the social behavior, indifferent to the lives of others, is not unlike the other versions of himself. The series implies more than once that war exists as several people, each a new vessel offering a different yet similar experience. In episode 10, it's petrification, in 11, it's torture and an electric chair, and in 8, it's, of course, an epidemic. And that's their origin point, a love for death, seated for everyone else to experience, death breeds wherever they go. Under such a mindset, the story suggests that to be war, the vessel must scrape their own death. Thus, in his debut, war shares the illness he helps propagate. During his second appearance, war falls in the endless crevice he forged, and in his third exhibition, War loses all longing for life after rehearsing his own execution. Ultimately, the achievement of the multiple versions of war is a sense of emptiness, shunyata and anatman. It is no nihilism but a hollow existence. They have nothing left to live for or contribute to the world. No sense of self or capacity to change. An extinction of all thoughts sustaining their introspective emptiness. And it's this self-extinguishment that marks the end of the drifting. And plastic death becomes the release. But maybe there are other routes. One of the most extraordinary aspects of Sonny Boy is its attraction to theoretical science, perhaps mentioning the correlation between cats and boxes as allegories of what is already an allegory. Schrodinger's cat may seem like a stretch. But what defines its incorporation in the series as more than a coincidence is the quantity of other references throughout the series. Geometrical bodies, like a torus in the opening episode, become early hints of the higher dimensions in the story. During episode 7, a series of spheres perform a double rotation. It illustrates a four-dimensional object from our three-dimensional perspective. One episode later, we get a payoff. Kodama manifests with her M powers, a tesseract, a four-dimensional cube. This demonstration exemplifies the nature of Kodama's powers, a mastery that extends beyond the control of mere matter but space-time as a whole. The manipulation of reality to this degree is not a case in isolation, as Akase's power suggests that possibility at a smaller scale. His abilities may not have as high of a skill ceiling as Kodama and her M power, but as the story progresses, Asakase's abilities progress as well. At first, Asakase can only crack his surroundings, reforge them. But soon, the weather or a whole island are under his control. Asakase is now playing in creative mode. Moreover, after some encouragement, Asakase gains access to other these worlds, similar to Nagara. Furthermore, 
Moving between these worlds is yet another example of the manipulation of space-time and its higher dimensions. What we see here is a brain or membrane, a group of complex, manifolds and submanifolds where their atlases or individual regions for simplicity overlap, rotate and reconnect with themselves all at the same time through the higher dimensions of space-time. Kodama wa koko ni aru subete o ino mama ni kontrol dekita. Mina wa sono chikara o emu to yobi, kanojo o kami no gotoku agamete itanda. Adrift, a person capable of manipulating the dimensions of space-time, such as Kodama could perform a unifying role across these worlds akin to a deity. Likewise, in real life theoretical physics, there is a series of famous hypotheses known as the theory of everything, seeking a unifying model for all fundamental interactions across the dimensions of the universe, just like Kodama does with her M power. An M is the name of a theory. A variant of a string theory and one of the most famous models for the theory of everything. The M theory. An M stands for membrane. The remaining mystery is if people like Kodama can form new these worlds of the Nagara variety. Kodama demonstrates the capacity to create new lands, and Yamabiko can materialize what exists within his mind as say this world. But Nagara's these worlds are different. They are not just new places, instead, they are new realities. Alternative dimensions with specific laws that at first Rajhani assumes. Nagara created until new discoveries and light the truth. Kimi wa sekai o sukutte ita wake janai. Kanonsei no hako o akete iru dake no tada no kansuk sha nan da yo. The Box of Possibilities is another reference to Schrodinger's cat and helps explain Nagara's true powers. He doesn't directly move between new these worlds, for the birth of many of those realities can occur with his arrival, but he is also not responsible for the direct creation of any new this world. The reason is not simple. These worlds are initially only possibilities, nothing more, but their existence arises from an observer effect, a sort of measurement emanated by Nagara's powers. Such interaction with a drift function makes those theoretical possibilities become a reality, a transition from the possible to the factual. Let's use an allegory as an illustration. Nagara's powers allow him to data mine and reproduce unused files in the source code of a program. Once Nagara extracts those files, they stop being unused data and become regular files. Except in the case of this series, those unused files are potential new these worlds that Nagara extracts at random from a box of possibilities. This is yet another reference to quantum mechanics. The quote, God does not place dice with the universe comes from Einstein and it doesn't refer to the literal monotheistic figure of God in Abrahamic religions. Instead, Einstein's quote is a response to the Copenhagen interpretation which postulates, among many other things, that a foundation of quantum mechanics is its non-determinism. Within this context, Einstein's mention of God references pantheism and the notion that a divine being 
only exist as a part of nature, our universe, and its laws as a sum of the whole. According to Einstein, within this deity that is our cosmos, randomness has no place in it. For the classical mechanics of the universe are deterministic. Einstein refusal to accept non-determinism in science, contrary to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, has become one of the most controversial aspects of Einstein's career. Einstein was wrong. God does play dice. However, before fully connecting all this verbiage to Sonny Boy, we still need a little bit more information. Quantum fluctuations are random changes of energy containing virtual particles. A transient state where a particle and an antiparticle appear from nothing and then nullify each other to avoid violating the law of conservation of energy. But Hawking theorized that the radiation from a black hole is the result of a series of virtual particles appearing at the event horizon, a sort of edge of the black hole. In such an event, the black hole will absorb one particle while the other remains outside and, as a consequence, transforms into a real particle. Today, Hawking radiation and especially quantum fluctuations are fundamental in the origin of our universe under the cosmic inflation theory. Now, if we apply this information to Sonny Boy at random, one group of students remains within the boundaries of the reality, while their exact replicas are materialized in absolute darkness, like the inside of a black hole. It is a process allegorical to Hawking radiation, but in reverse. Thus, for one group of students to remain in their reality, the other must carry the opposite charge by going adrift. The result for Nagara and his friends is that they have become cosmic waste. The students we follow are fluctuations in the system of their reality. Their selection, cloning and transportation adrift is a mere part of the random process of these worlds. But that is all. An act of nature, void of intentions, purpose or significance beyond any meaning the students can create by themselves. At this point, it is important to clarify something. The director of Sony Boy, Shingo Natsume, is not a physicist and neither am I, which means that this series is not trying to be hard sci-fi, and my reasoning is open to correction from people with more knowledge on the subject. Nevertheless, for the narrative of this anime, its vagueness is for the best. When most movies, books or TV shows incorporate quantum mechanics into their plots, the resultant story comes out as pretentious pseudoscience. That doesn't mean that no one can consider Sony Boy and my comments about it to be pretentious pseudoscience. But the fact that Sony Boy doesn't overexpose or brags about its concepts allows it to incorporate science into the plot but avoids making it easy to nitpick while working thematically in favor of the narrative. There might not be a why in Sony Boy, but there is a how. 
Nagara can only look at the box of possibilities, but that fear requires someone or something that can provide that box. When Nagara discovers that his powers can generate new these worlds, he embodies a paradigm change. The enigma of the drifting begins to focus around him. Guilt follows Nagara once his classmates accuse him of being responsible for their school going adrift. And they are in wrong. But the accusations don't stop there. From the perspective of many other generations, Nagara is solely responsible for the thousands of students trapped adrift. Nagara is responsible for the materialization of multiple these worlds and the drifting of his classmates. But it is unlikely and oversimplistic to consider Nagara responsible for all the other cases of drifting and the evidence is in his favor. Every single one of the student generations adrift arrived at the same age, 40 years old, and only months away from their respective junior high school graduation. From the point of view of our protagonist, the day of rapture for their schoolmates exists in either their past, future, or a completely alternate reality with only their school as a constant. The moment of arrival for the clones of a generation can vary by hundreds or thousands of years, as is the case of Yamabiko, creating a context in which Nagara cannot be responsible for all those people drifting across time and dimensions. Their responsibility must lie elsewhere in the person or the place that is a constant. Back in their reality, when some of the students' powers began to manifest, their abilities could not surpass the boundaries of God's terrains. In Sony Boy, for a reality to exist alongside the paranormal, it first requires it to be a type of this world. ながらの能力がこの世界を作る行為で、その能力が元の世界から始まっているとすれば、能力が使えた学校の中もある種この世界の一つなのかもしれない。漂流が僕たちだけでなく、同じ学校で繰り返し起きていたというのはそういうことな
私たちの漂流コピーはあの子が原因ってことああおそらくなだがこれもながらが世界を作っていたのと同じで無意識のうちに現象の存在に関わっていただけだ Another mystery emerges the cards demonstrate to be intelligent creatures capable of disobeying the orders of Misuho if it's against their sense of ethics. Nagara even describes them as capable of perceiving the status of all things. But Sakura, the white cat, only refers to the drifting as Unavoidable. For the rest of the series, it remains an enigma the cat's precise involvement in the drifting or their exact motivation for complying with God. Kami sama, Kimi ga hyoryu o k o s h t a n d a t e i w a r e t a On the other hand, Misuho's involvement is emphasized when immortality becomes the defining factor for all lives adrift. Stasis is the engine of the drifting, the one unbreakable element across all. This world, it allows the adrift to exist as it is and preserves the box of possibilities open for use. But Misuho is not to blame. The drifting is the synthetic product of God's supplies of powers on his terrain. To reiterate, the drifting and God's plan have no deeper meaning. They are just a part of God's indifferent volition, an act of nature that doesn't materialize because it's purposeful, but simply because it's possible. In this context, Misuho only happens to be the one person capable of keeping. The box of possibilities open, and Nagara is the one with the ability to look at what's inside. The drifting is a fatal nism at the belly of their reality. In conception, long before the students even knew about their powers. I know that many people who watched Sony Boy chose to dismiss most of these technicalities in the story. That makes sense. After all, the narrative declines any digestible exposition. And focusing on the symbolic meaning behind everything is in a wrong approach. To this series. Nevertheless, after multiple rewatches, it's clear that Natsume cared about all these technicalities. For example, from the very first episode, the story foreshadows the drifting mechanics and invests time in figuring out its mysteries. But in contrast to other mystery shows, Sony Boy. Retains its internal consistency all the way to the finale. Ne, Kimi wa Himawari ha? Sore tomo Tanpopo ha? Within the lives. Of every one of these students, there is a pervasive anxiety centered on their lives and the uncertain future. A little bit of time vanishes at every moment. While the commitments of adulthood soon to fall into their hands, 
boil the pressures of life, no matter how young or unprepared they are. Precisely in these circumstances, the drifting is not the origin of anxiety, but an expansion of the reality system across contamination disease. Every student adrift is connected homeward through their akin, but in a metaphor of life only for a finite amount of time. After a couple of months, their compulsory education is over, graduation is here, their link to the school is gone, and now they must choose what to make of their lives. Nozomi, for her part, is an abnormality in the system. A person that knows what she wants and strives to dictate the meaning of her own life. Nozomi glimpses and, with resolve, pursues the light. Nothing can stop her, but life itself. <laughs> the transition to adulthood is a foggy road. For the students, after graduation, several paths become available. But the proper direction distorts in self-doubt. For one of the few who knows what he wants in life, the drifting takes that road away. <laughs> to a certain extent, it is appropriate. Professional sports careers have delicate balances. Small mistakes can destroy it a lifetime's effort. With only a few sports figures remaining relevant above the rest. Nevertheless, most professions alone shouldn't define a person. But for the students adrift, what else do they have in life other than existence itself? <laughs> For those with powers, the doors are open. With their abilities, they can define their identity as it facilitates them a role to play. But for those without powers, there doesn't seem to be a place suited for them in these worlds. Adrift. Existence crashes like a tsunami, hostage of his static float. Their lives, enveloped by the tides of time, sink under the weight of introspection. And as light distorts in ink, everything they can aspire to arouses their suffocation. For a drowning person, a single breath feels like all they ever need. But with awareness comes realization. They don't need to breathe. Suffocation is reality as it is expected to be. Soon, even suffocation becomes mundane until they forget it's there. Just like they forgot to breathe and their existence shrinks. Among this existential chaos, one girl chooses to hide a piece of herself. I'm 
物語のような語りで聞こえるのだ。Let's pause for a moment and point something out. I don't know Japanese, so for this video I had to trust Funimation's official subtitles, as that's the website where I originally watched this anime. However, this is one of the few mistakes in the subtitles that I'm capable of noticing. Subasa doesn't say that she can read minds, but rather that she can hear hearts. That is not a superficial change. The description of her powers is not a romanticization or an elaborated way to describe telepathy, but a distinctive aspect of her abilities that we most remember when we see her interact with other characters. Such is the case of Asakase. A person who demonstrates resentment against his reality. That grievance fits his insecurities and forms a persona made of jealousy and envy. An inflated ego becomes his answer, but even that ignites his feelings of rejection. In the end, it only helps intensify his resentment. Asakase's failure to make his life satisfying, despite his advantages, denotes that the drifting mechanics don't guarantee fulfillment in life, even for those. With immense power. Attained by the power, I couldn't control myself. But that's all for today. In this instance, Subasa perceives honesty in Asakase, which is a correct assumption of Asakase's feelings, but a poor understanding of his mind. The nature of Subasa's powers allows her. To discern a person's heart as a story, it translates thoughts and feelings into a narrative. But a person's thoughts only offer a small fraction of the spectrum of who they truly are. I was really Asakase-kun. I knew it, but it was different. What for Subasa is inaccessible in someone else's mind is what, even for that person, remains beyond their self-understanding. What stands in their subconscious. It is the fundamental flaw of Subasa's powers. <laughs> no, Sumi falls, and Asakase loves it. Kogoro no oksako wa jibun demo nozoke nai. A decision that Asakase himself cannot reason or justify. So to defend his ego, he blames Nagara. Resentment. Perhaps it may seem like it has no relation at first, but the classic film *Stalker* actually handles this theme. Beautifully, a quote in particular perfectly illustrates what we're talking about. If trying to pursue meaning or fulfillment fails, then the antithesis is to stay in harmony, not Taoism, but passivity in life, turned into a dog and chew a bone. Atemonak sekai wo atari aruite ita, kurushimi mo yorokobi mo nai hibi wo yari soroshi, tada iki nagara ita. An attitude that doesn't trace reason, but instead orbits around doubt, avoiding distressing emotions until it collapses with the results. I am only regretting my life. I am regretting my life. I am regretting my life. I am regretting my life. Resentment. 
in actions, she predicaments when Yama vehicles lonely experience, collides with Kodama and her mundane insecurities submerging beyond her demigoddess reach. Yama Biko identifies those worries and ignores them. Resentment. It is not the first time in the story that blind fate has become a source of tragedy, but this case is still peculiar. In Sony Boy, most characters possess a name reflective of their distinctive personality. This is not a secret, however, Kodama goes a little further in her peculiar symbolism. As a person, Kodama not only exists in between allegories of religion and theoretical physics, but also stands as a reference to Japanese folklore. Kodamas is the name of the spirits of the trees, protectors of nature and creatures of peace most of the time, making an exception only against those who damage the environment. So Kodama in Sony Boy symbolizes a profound connection with nature. And let's remember, in this series, God and nature are self-same. Kodama is, therefore, a representation of religion, nature, and science existing in unification. An imposition over her shoulders that she accepts with inner reluctance. For a religious figure, holder of tremendous power and whom everyone venerates, her actions hold irony. John Paul Sacht calls this attitude but fate. Kodama is giving up her freedom, life, and preferences to the authority and rules of this world. Only where she becomes passive and reactive and, as a result, to her likeness, her community transmutes. Rejection of the truth makes Kodama believe that her powers are enough to cure the illness. But that assumption denies her identity, what she can be, or how she can exist. The path chosen leads Kodama towards regret, idiosyncrasies that stimulate the crimson tumor, or, as Nietzsche defines it, resentment. The result of a person's internalized frustrations, failures, and insecurities. To Nietzsche, victims of resentment or resentment often materialize their inner problems in external entities. Like a disease that afflicts the wounded minds of a community until it leaves the last man alive. According again to Nietzsche, the last man is essentially the average person living in our modern culture. A person who encapsulates the qualities of passiveness, indifference, conformity, and nihilism. Not unlike Nagara at the beginning of the series or Yamabiko during his past. And precisely, Yamabiko's deliberate passiveness and hesitation is what reshapes his existence into the form of a dog. Someone who follows and obeys only acting as is necessary for others without providing any substance of his own to the world or the girl he loves. Hence, Yamabiko stands immune. He is complacent, rejecting his desires and neglecting his agony and discomfort as if it would just fade away. But the disease spreads. <laughs> 
In the end, an unproductive Yamabiko can only sleep with his regrets. Kanojo no negai wa issho ni soto no sekai wa aruite hoshi. Sore dake datta. As a side note, the green sum tumor in the show takes inspiration from the Tasmanian devil's facial tumor disease. A transmissible cancer is spread among Tasmanian devils through their bites. But fighting each other is innate to this species, a reason why they are a solitary animal. However, contact is necessary during mating season, so the altercations become unavoidable. Thus, their species behavior and their need to survive combine to produce an illness that currently threatens them with extinction. And I think we can begin to see the parallels with Yamabiko. Coincidentally, or maybe not, in a civilization victim of its behavior and routine, Yamabiko remains as the last man. Immune to the plague, he helps propagate. And just like Zarathustra spoke, his race is as ineradicable as the flea, the last man lives longest. Just look at these superfluous people, they turn everything to sickness and calamity. In the culture of the last man, when God fails as a mentor, a vacuum is left. An existential abyss that consumes our era, leaving us with no moral to guide us, no structure to encourage us. A gap in civilization molds the face of war, who avails of this crisis to accomplish his ultimate task. And so, as Nietzsche illustrates, God is dead, Kodama is dead, but only buried can the seed begin to grow. Of course, the tragedy of this situation relies on their suffering being preventable. The overlooked early symptoms and the cure at Yamabiko's grasp. Yamabiko and his powers are responsible for the creation of the plague, but his powers can also be the vaccine. It only requires Yamabiko to have the determination to materialize the ideal world he envisions in his mind, the will to power. The ability to conceive our will to improve our lives is, for simplicity's sake, Nietzsche's definition of the will to power. Yet another concept that resembles Yamabiko and his power to materialize what is within his mind. <laughs> Had Yamabiko attempted a substantial improvement to his life, he could have dissolved the this world of illness, but instead barricaded in his dog form, Yamabiko stagnated. The naivety only dissipates from his mind when he dreams of an unfulfilled wish. A fire turns on, and Yamabiko awakes. It is now that for Yamabiko to exist as he envisions in his mind, first he needs to accept the death of God. Yamabiko 
Only through this confession, the long path of self-reflection and a proactive life, Yamabiko manages to defeat resentment. And for him, it took five thousand years. In a more subtle note, Yamabiko also manages to live up to his name. Similar to the Kodamas, Yamabiko is the name of an anthropomorphic dog-shaped yokai, an arboreal being that, according to legends, echoes the voice of the valleys and its trees, just like the Kodamas spirits. Hence, when Mizuku makes money rain and the forest burns, Yamabiko wake him up is symbolically an answer to the call of the trees, the voice of Kodama. Unsurprisingly, Nagara sees a bit of himself in Yamabiko, as their past personalities, non-social behavior, and passive mindsets lead them down paths of regrets. This feeling of impotence is dangerous. Fortunately, encouragement encounters Nagara thanks to the person that can penetrate through his shell. Nozomi herself is not perfect. She makes a mistake hiding her anxieties behind smiles. Nevertheless, contrary to Kodama, Nozomi disallows others to define her existence, refusing to live in bad fate. And that trait enables Nozomi to identify other people's problems. The long path of self-reflection proposes the tools to improve our lives, but it first requires the individual to accept the past as it is so that they can prioritize a future still in formation. That is how life is set up to be. Hmm. Nagara's first sign of progression is to help a lost cat, seeking to redeem himself for the dope he left to die. Nozomi puts in motion a slow but gradual change within Nagara. At one point in episode 4, Nozomi admits admiration towards an umpire who, against external pressures, remains loyal to his ethics. He was in the world. A couple of episodes later, Nagara does the same when he opposes the status quo of Babel, an act that takes him to the highest point of the tower. By the end of the same episode, Nagara establishes a firm determination to control the direction of his life. In a platonic way, Mizuho seems to like this aspect of Nagara. Her friendship becomes another gear that helps push Nagara forward. Ultimately, Nagara's superpowers are not responsible for his character development. Rather, his human actions have achieved substantial changes to his life. Rajhani emphasizes that postulation when they interact with the film role in the movie theater, This World. 
この差は長野がプレビューに参加しているかどうかだけだつまりフィルムを編集しただけじゃ世界は変わらない重要なのはそれを君が見るかどうかだ In other words, to change his reality, Nagara must be an active participant in forging the course of his life. The concept of the immovable past, regret, and the many possible futures extend to the point that the series. Offers a little glimpse of the original Nagara. In this timeline, instead of moving adrift, Nagara leaves Nosomi behind. Now, living with neither sadness nor joy, Nagara stagnates in his own regrets. By the end, a last man sees this world move without him. But for our Nagara, this dreaded future. Projects itself as a reality. Once again, proactiveness is the solution, the conquer of resentment. Yamabiko, now above his feelings of discomfort, has the determination to accomplish his promise, seeking to redeem himself from his regrets and at last fly out. And take off they do. But Asakase, for his part, remains a victim of resentment. And for many other students, their futures don't look too bright either. On the one hand, the people who follow Aki, gathering as a mass, resemble Kodama's followers, giving up their autonomy to a central figure of stability, while on the other hand, Hoshi's resentment towards God translates into suffering for the people around him. Nietzsche's final prediction asserts his worries about the dead. Of God, that being a unifying entity, and how it will send modern civilization towards its collapse. In that line of thinking, Sonny Boy reminds us that the objective of war is to kill God. And for many philosophers, the collapse of modernity occurred during World War II, ushering in postmodernity. Nagara realizes that killing God wouldn't solve their problems. It will instead be a mere extension of their issues with no provided closure. In this instance, even proactiveness, the will to power, needs aspirations to pursue, and yet. We have come all this way, and there is still no answer for the students adrift. No objective to acquire, no substance to embrace. The existing human beings are not going to go any further. They are not going to do anything. 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 Adrift, like a trackless railway, the act of living is naked. All purposes vanish in eternity, and no imaginary can govern life's direction. But they must board the train when the only station is forward in time. To leap is an ultimatum. Adrift, the students don't need to work. The material goods they can obtain are unnecessary. They also don't need food. Starvation can't 
happen in stasis. But from these rules and limitations, the students acquire a unique opportunity to reshape their life and obtain a meaning of their own. The Mice Revolution from Episode 5 depicts a little metaphor of the student's predicament. Similarly, in a relocation across worlds, the students experience a shift in what's absolute, a stage where their views of themselves and what they must or should do with their lives are no longer valid. Within this framework, a previous symbol of the story acquires a new foundation. The student's power holdovers signalizes their transformation into objects with specific uses or purposes that sustain their existence. In an ironic twist, reaching the closest state to death in the drifting guarantees that their existence now has a goal to meet. An antidote for the existential dread Tsubasa perceives in her peers. I always find it interesting how that last thought came to Tsubasa's mind right after remembering Sakura. It's almost like that assertion is an extension of the cat's thoughts and her perception of the student's immortality. Maybe it suggests that their lives in the drifting should end in self-conquering. Of course, when we talk about death, we need to acknowledge one of the biggest enigmas of the series. Why is the version of Nosomi in her homeworld dead? And the answer is actually simple. It doesn't matter. Sure, we can speculate for a long time about what some of her lines may imply. But the causes of Nozomi's death in the real world are trivial to the story. For the same reason, the anime doesn't emphasize her tragic end adrift. Nozomi's two deaths convey a concise lesson. It is irrelevant for the characters to know why Nozomi died or to witness her fatal fall. These two versions of Nozomi are dead and nothing can change that. Even in the world of the absurd, death offers no returns. A fact of life that the characters most learned to avoid resentment. Nozomi wa mou modoranai. A power holdover is the legacy of a person. Thus, the lack of death in the adrift serves a purpose. The absurdity of an eternal life slowly directs the students to compose a meaning of their own. In the flow of life, or samsara on their body's beliefs, everything that exists, physical or mental, is temporal, anika. Whether in its formation, disintegration, or evolution, all component things are impermanent. That is one of the fundamental sutras of Gautam Buddha, or Buddha for simplicity.
To recognize their existence dilutes is to understand that all suffering, misery, or frustration, the sources of dukkha, are a natural part of life. Thus, the liberation from all dukkha first necessitates the detachment from all anika, the realization that there is no pure consciousness to find, no perpetual or inherent essence to subtract, a confession that the self is nil, anatta. These are the three marks of existence in Buddhism. Furthermore, the result of an existence dependent on other phenomena, but all, including ourselves, without essence, is known as shunyata, vacuity, voidness, or emptiness. Our sense of identity relies on external conditions or formations or lacking a permanent or intrinsic essence, all empty. This principle is not a step to transcend reality, but rather a foundation to develop our consciousness. In traditional Buddhist beliefs, self-development reshapes the soul during samsara's rebirth. As the course of life, suffering and death repeats. To cease the cycle requires a consciousness desolated from all hatred, envy or craving, a complete inner emptiness. Without the need for any subtraction nor addition, that which can exist as it is. Hence, only one possible state remains, Nirvana, a condition that literally translates as blowing out or becoming extinguished. In these worlds, where death is absent and the physical body is stationary, the everlasting chain of life may shudder through the only part of the student's bodies that is still subject to change, their minds. Adrift, mind through time, slowly distills all beings until an acquired form preserves their existence for eternity. In the anecdote about the inventor of death, Rajhani recalls how this peculiar individual, through hideous actions and firm determination, aims to liberate himself from the definitive rule of all these worlds. この世界の精神を打ち破ろうとしたんだ。実を言うと僕はちょっとだけ彼に憧れを抱いたんだ。倫理観はともかく、これはこの世界に対する挑戦だからね。But the inventor of death lives in contradiction to Rajkani's beliefs. Anger, hatred, and grudge are all components of his persona. Determination is his only facet to admire the unbendable resolution to exercise his will against this world. Notwithstanding his actions, the invention came to fruition. In this chair, the inventor discovers the shortcut between meditation, absorption, and wisdom. A compressed Buddha path that liberates the mind from the shackles of life. And with that, 
we are back to the origins of the multiple wars and death in the reality adrift. As episode 10 demonstrates, the achievements of the wars are empty, literally. The context of this scene implies that this version of war seeking his own death jumped into this endless gorge, and in it he found internal peace, leaving behind only an empty carcass. Not at all different from what Hosh attained upon sitting in his electric chair. The adopters of war achieved a state of extinguishment. This is the definitive phase of all lives adrift. To make the mind void and, similar to Nirvana, end the cycle of existence, assuring that no source of Dukkha can invade their thoughts and no impermanence can govern their culture. He knew that it all may sound bleak, particularly when we only witness such fulfillment in the hands of the most nefarious characters. But Rajkhani's monologue suggests that sooner or later the majority of students garner this status. But even adrift in the worlds of the absurd, dead and ceaseless nothingness are the eventual endpoint to all things. In samsara, to rebirth and the noble path, our minds can open the way to nirvana. But adrift, through the course of eternity, most students' minds will obtain liberation and internal peace, leaving behind only the relics of their past beings. Ah, tamashi nante mono wa nakte, ishiki wa nan no imi mo naku umarete, tada kiete iku. Jinsei wa hate shinai toro da. Without a doubt, Rajhani is the most prominent positive force that contrasts war's behavior. He doesn't enact ill over the world, yet his insightful mind grows in the shape of a forest. We can even witness it to different shots of appropriately Buddha showcase the passage of time. In the second picture, the lianas and a vast vegetation embrace the statue of Buddha, suggesting that all this greenery is now Rajhani. Perhaps this is why God identifies war as a threat to these worlds. Not for war's disdain towards God or for his rebellion against the rules, but because war's actions exponentially accelerate astray the process of change within the students. This will help explain why, when God takes possession of death, he never uses the revolver except for demonstration. If this theory is correct, it will imply that God's actions, despite all his schemings, are somewhat altruistic. God will create a context where all the students adrift have the potential to elevate their existence by polishing their minds and end all life impulses on their own terms. Thereby, the ultimate goal of the drifting will be to reach nothingness. But, その輝きは尊いと思うんだ。それはその時、その人だけのものだからね。
Here lies, within this dialogue from Rajkhani, the solution to an empty existence and the enigma of the drifting. The acceptance of a meaningless reality to encourage the enjoyment of life itself. Not hedonism, but the mere delight of being alive. This current of thought has a name, absurdism. The philosophy that considers life void of meaning and all attempts to capture its essence are futile. So the grand mystery of existence is to determine whether or not life is worth living. For Albert Camus, creator of absurdism, embracing the absurd is a liberating activity in any human life. For the acceptance of mortality and no transcendent truths focuses the mind on elevating the conditions of our reality. Camus' famous quote, one must imagine Sisyphus happy, is an invitation to accept the absurd and paradoxically revolt against it, thus finding in what's consciously absurd a self-sufficient satisfaction, a life without false hopes or illusions but with a freedom that allows us to live the bleakness of reality to its fullest. In episode 7, Nagara receives a similar lesson from his friend Futatsuboshi. Like a metaphor for the meaning of life, in Babel, the students work for an objective that may only exist in fairy tales. But the result doesn't matter, Futatsuboshi is seeking to make the best of what he has. He knows about the lie that governs over his life, embraces it, and in consequence, lives a happier life. After all, the real meaning of life was the friends we made along the way. However, with war, eternity no longer leads to inner improvement but mutates in response to external and involuntary stimulations. Based on the subtitles, God is not referring to any this world, but rather to the students living in it, as war's death denies them any potential development when he forces them to become hollow objects. Something similar happens to the twins. The one-of-a-kind gun they use with its toy appearance and goofy sounds contrast the realistic revolver born from war's essence. The implication here is that the toy gun they use doesn't contain the power of death, nor does it conquer or develop. Instead, it is, as one of the twins calls it, a skip to the moment of emptiness. And this fact is what denies the aforementioned theory that God could be altruistic. He doesn't care about the twins killing each other with a prototype of death because that is his creation. God forces the students to live adrift, but after that he is indifferent to the students' lives as long as they exist under the conditions of these worlds. By the end of the story, we have witnessed what appears to be the three most likely outcomes of those living adrift. To embrace voidness like the numerous war, a forced transmutation by the power of death, or the natural and luminous growth of the individual like Rajkhani. And precisely, for Nagara and Mizuho, a previous lesson from Rajkhani, perhaps more important than his teachings on life, must not be forgotten. 
故郷の情景が描かれた世界があってねそれは恐ろしいほどに正確で鮮明何より神秘的だった不安になるくらいにね元の世界より元の世界らしい世界だったその世界の主は病的なほど思い出にとらわれ故郷を描き続けたんだネスタルジェイサトゥールトゥディストールデパースト It protects the mind and the ego by altering our filter of reality. The simulation, as Nietzsche will call it, it's that comfortable illusion of representing the world in sync with our sensitivities or biases. Rejoicing in the pleasure of avoiding reality as it truly is. A deception that blends in memory until it becomes indistinguishable from the truth. 簡単な話。彼は現実を受け入れなかったんだよ。恋人も彼に目の前の現実を生きてほしいと願っていた。でも彼は変わらなかった。その子は彼と美しい思い出じゃなくて、まだ形のない未来を一緒に作りたかったんだ。Naturally, the aftermath of these monologues ends with Nagara triggering a memory of Nosomi, of tragic optimism and a deceptive promise. A Nagara cries. <laughs> Now that the route to escape the drifting is available, this fable from Rajhani warns Mizuho of any wistful memories and false idolism in discrepancy with a disheartening reality. Once Nagara and Mizuho reach their new home, they will become prisoners of reality, unable to escape its jurisdiction or disappointments. 果たして自分は本当に現実を生きていると言えるだろうかって。But they must confront life. And with this disposition, Nagara and Mizuho are ready to return to the real world. At this point, they're the only two capable of doing so. これで準備は整った。Time tangles for all versions of a single character. Two years living adrift means that two years have also passed for all versions of Nagara and Mizuho existing across dimensions. Time is not reversible. This is why Rajhani's plan in episode 6 is unrepeatable. His method relies on the student's connection with the school where their powers and the drifting originate. But by the end of the same episode, they graduate, losing their connection to the school. However, in the follow up episodes, new revelations emerge. Nagara's new plan to return home involves a pure reality like our own, where the paranormal never became more than a rumor. Once there, they will substitute their analog version by fusing their bodies into one. For someone like Yamabiko, or even Rajkani, at this point in the story, whose lives extend beyond what is human, the real world is not an option. There is no life for them to assimilate. Of their physical bodies, only dust will remain. Adrift, after living for millennia, their futures cannot subsist. In the real world. With the cuts, another problem e m e r g e In the real world, cuts don't talk or have superpowers. I know what a shock. This fact, once again, indicates how the absurd flourished in their original world. Just like war. Brings a plague from one world to another, 
God set us a series of superpowers in this world, explaining the strange supernatural incidents that happened in their school long before the drifting. A version of Mizuho's cats still exists in the real world, but when she and Agara aspire for a mundane reality, the pets with human-like intelligence collide with their goal to attain. A similar concern previous to her death existed within Osomi. A gap in the drifting towards an uncertain reality is the light Nosomi saw, and thus episode 6 illustrates the shadow of the deceased eclipses her life's pathways. Furthermore, substitution being a new route makes them apprehensive about the risks of losing their memories, sense of identity, or even their lives. If the characters fail and reach another reality where Nozomi is dead, Nagara has no hope. For no one can return from death, exist without a body, or rewrite the past. Unlike the bear he left to die, the regret and impotence will become another scar on his memory. To move forward, Nagara needs to accept the possibility that Nozomi may also be dead in their new reality. That idea creates resentment, the poisonous memory. For Asakase, this means perpetual dissatisfaction. But for Nagara, its motivation to take the compass and aim for a world of realism, but also prospect. Nagara understands that their mistakes, regrets, disappointments and defeats stand unadulterated at their root, prevailing in their original world. And so, besieged by this moral of insight, Nagara transmutes his experience into the fuel to pursue and catch Nozomi's light. Ambition for the real world not only implies enduring it with all its flaws, but beyond that, for Mizuho, it creates a dreaded certainty forever under death's gaze. For Nagara, it seizes the power to change or create new these worlds. To escape will no longer be an option. The concession to renounce their powers is the necessary sacrifice to escape the drifting. In episode 6, the characters have resolved, but they don't sacrifice anything. Merely dragging and accepting the fantasy of the drifting while also attempting to depart from it. Ergo, it is not a dichotomy between the desire to escape these worlds and not being able to but between the firm determination to abandon the absurd and the struggle to act according to the desired result. The open box of possibilities sustains the final barrier between these worlds and reality through the status shared between all students adrift. 
that which is their unchanging condition, stasis. To obtain the mundane, Mizuho must give up immortality to close the box anew, returning uncertainty to their lives and embracing the immeasurable future. In between the void and the manifold of dimensions, we witness for a third time in the series a glimpse of the original Nagara departing from the school to be released into this world. With dash hopes and a dead Nozomi, this version of Nagara lives in passivity, his face engraved in lament. But adrift, Nagara moves ahead. For a final time, go to box the paranormal and its connection to this world. The casting of irregular formations, a mysterious woman and a power holdover accentuate the required sacrifices of grand power, immortality and escapism. In response, Nagara keeps moving ahead, no longer tracing the result of God's dice. Amidst the defilement of God's principles, Mitsuho witnessed a proactive version of Nagara, and a subtle admiration slips from her gaze. For the wave of Nagara's actions reaches even Asakase, compelling him to help his former classmates. A collapse of neglect, at last, the birds fly again, shattering the firmament in light's direction. And thus, the world is within their reach. Standing now in light's ground, Misuho, in tribute, grants Stasis, her real power, inducing closure to the box of possibilities and the drifting. Nagara and Mizuho enter reality. Oh mundanity, what a gracious yet unfortunate blessing. A melange of pleasures and anxieties, the feral stress upon the haunting routine. But it doesn't matter how disappointing life might be, the character selected the ordinary and unalloyed reality and rejected the fabrications of escapism. In a way, Sony Boy is an anti-isekai. For those unaware, isekai is an anime subgenre where one or more characters get transported to a magical world full of possibilities, allowing them to abandon their everyday struggles, responsibilities, anxieties or loneliness as they submerge in the delights of power, fame and heroism in a fantasy land. Thus, the average isekai fulfills the desire for escapism in both the literal and metaphorical sense. For its part, Sony Boy meets the minimum requirement of having a set of characters transported to another world where magic is real, making it an isekai. But of course, this anime also avoids or rather distorts the other tropes of the subgenre. Our protagonists are all solitary individuals disconnected from the rest of their peers. However, in the drifting, their new powers provide no happiness or fulfillment. Instead, they start to miss the comfort found in mundanity. Meanwhile, Nagara avoids any predicament in his life. But adrift, his powers incite the harassment of his companions, sinking his conscience in guilt. 
de driftin, dosenime në fer, a gran objektiv or transcendental purpose, i rol një probajtës dhe karakters, guira diskonfortin, immortality, growing stronger every day, within them. The series also debates having any internal monologue, one of the most common and overdue tropes in manga anime. The one exception is in episode 10, where Subasa's monologues end up demonstrating how little the characters actually know themselves and the people around them. Nevertheless, Nagara finds himself in the company of two girls, but this is not a harem. Mizuho remains a true friend, never shy to criticize Nagara's demeanor, while Nozomi dies far away from him, depriving Nagara of the opportunity to be honest with his feelings. And yet, it would be incorrect to consider Sony Boy a deconstruction of the isekai subgenre, as it doesn't seem like an intentional attack against the tropes of those animes. Rather, it seeks to dissuade the characters from the indulgences of escapism like an anti-isekai. Here lies the central thesis of Sony Boy, a story that advocates facing the real world, not because it perceives fantasy as socially detrimental, but because it wants us to be conscious of this, our only reality. The place where our future, regardless of imperfections, is symbols. In episode 5, the revolutionary mouse incident seems to foreshadow these implications. Thus, when Nagara and Mizuho escaped to a mundane world, gold is not absolute, for death is unavoidable and their powers fade. This is not another stage, it's reality. And the real world canvas is grey, it's light, tinged with dismay. Nagara, now legally independent, uses his autonomy and inner maturity to do unsurprisingly mundane everyday activities. From the classroom to a part-time job, from boredom to exhaustion and no attained satisfaction, but gleams a promising light, a smidgen of Nagara's proactivity and a spark of optimism. At last, Yamabiko and Kodama reunite. In the past, Yamabiko failed to keep his promise, but indirectly, through Nagara's actions, he accomplishes Kodama's will, attaining the light he once dreaded to lose. However, this reality of remarkable normality evokes doubt in Agara. A girl once cast in mysterious lighting is now another gear of the system. Just a regular person is struggling with the standards of contemporary life. She may have her complexities and difficulties, but she is also mundane. From those two years submerged in a sea of extravaganza, only one relic remains. Nozomi's holdover in an endless rumble within the light's interior. For once, past events favor Nagara. Two compasses, one copycat, sacrificed per God's stipulation to end stasis, while the original, handed by Asakase, persists in this world where Nozomi lives and death subsists. Mizuho's life rhymes with Nagara's through her average distress. Her grandmother is now the ashes she embraces and the oldest cat dies. 
without a stasis, agile death reaffirms its intrinsic bequest. Mortality is another natural yet unsatisfying aspect of a reality of non-existent getaway portals and where the cop a shattered glass on the floor doesn't restore itself. Perhaps due to her grief, Misuha avoids Nagara at first, too exhausted by her melancholy to face him at the moment. Again, Misuho's life doesn't differ far from Nagara's, so her delayed response traces a proactive behavior and accompanies her dry sense of humor. <laughs> Beneath the rain, during memories of other worlds and avenues considered, honesty decides to flourish. The reward for breaching into reality is to confront its displeasures. The mundane is a path to dismay and sorrow. Dukkha. And yet, Nagara is confident of his decision. Unlike these worlds, a mere individual cannot change reality. There's no magic to fix its problems, but they must be active members of their world. Escaping is vain, only through the acceptance of death, of their failures frozen in their past, and the mindfulness of future possibilities, can Nagara and Misuho extinguish themselves from samsara and the eternal return. For now, only one fear remains. Now, Deemed are the discrepancies between realities, almost all of Nagara's life problems persist in this reality, accentuating his dissatisfaction. But the lessons from his imprisonment in that ethereal venue persevere. For now, at least. Journey's end carries its impetus, yet motivation dilutes in time. Lessons fade into new memories and the same mistakes may happen again. But Misuho knows best. Back when they ran towards the light, Misuko gazed at Nagara with inquiry and wonder. She realized all the growth and maturity Nagara absorbed inside the island. So, Misuko reminds Nagara to be more assertive with his life, closer to the best version of himself. They both depart with a smile on their faces, after all. Once Nagara made a promise, the code to black foreshadows that their promise will not be fulfilled. Nagara now cares about the birds, tries to help them, but he doesn't take them home.
The feathers still sway in his hesitation, his cardinal flow yet to conquer. In the passage of life, Nagara locates in the station of disappointments, where the distant laughing girl, sickness and death, and his parents' neglect prevail in his life. But the future is undefined. Progress is not earned by clinging to these positions, but by its emancipation. At the end of Sunny Boy, Nagara walks away from a train station, a previous symbol of stagnation. It alludes to a better understanding of how Nagara must experience his life. It's a dry message, but Nagara has hope.